your game. Take it. Welcome back to Fact Me Up channel. In today's video, we're going to explore one of the most popular Netflix series The Queen's Gambit. From its stunning visuals to its compelling characters, there's so much to discover about this show. Join us as we uncover 11 surprising facts about the show that was binge-watched by 62 million households within 28 days of its release in 2020. The Queen's Gambit was originally going to be Heath Ledger's directorial debut. Ever since securing the rights to The Queen's Gambit in the early 1990s, the Netflix show's co-creator Alan Scott has come close several times to turning the story of Beth Harmon into a reality, including in 2007 when he approached the late Heath Ledger to see if he would direct a film adaptation. When speaking with The Independent in late 2020, Scott revealed that Ledger, who had just completed his work on The Dark Knight, was passionate about the project and was immediately drawn to the story. The original plan was to have Heath Ledger direct the film at some point in late 2008 and Elliot Page was considered for the role of Beth. However, those plans were brought to an abrupt stop in January of that year when Ledger sadly passed away of an accidental overdose in a New York City apartment. The Netflix effect is when a new series catapults an unknown or forgotten topic to fame overnight as a result of millions of people binge-watching a show, and that's exactly what happened to the chess industry after the Queen's Gambit series was released. After the Queen's Gambit made its debut on Netflix in October 2020, 62 million households binge-watched the series within its first 28 days, after which inquiries for chess sets increased 250% on eBay, the sales of chess books went up a staggering 603% and Google search queries for how to play chess hit an all-time high in nine years. The original novel The Queen's Gambit also became a New York Times bestseller 37 years after its release, and the number of new players on the Chess.com website increased five times. One of the Netflix's most popular series The Queen's Gambit is based on Walter Tevis' 1983 book by the same name. Born in San Francisco in 1928, Tevis was 55 years old by the time he wrote The Queen's Gambit, and as a result some aspects of the protagonist's story were drawn directly from his own experiences. According to David Hill's reporting for The Ringer, Tevis learned to play chess at seven years old, but he wasn't a prodigy and didn't go on to compete professionally until he was an adult. Although he never ascended to Beth's level, he still appreciated the intricacies of the game and was rated somewhere between 14 and 1600. Tevis also spent time in a convalescent home as a child due to medical complications, during which time his parents effectively abandoned him. Carers at that facility regularly drugged him with phenobarbital three times a day, and Tevis credited this early experience with drugs as a precursor to the alcoholism he developed as an adult, a parallel that is clear in the book. He was able to overcome his alcohol habit in the 1970s with help from Alcoholics Anonymous. The show's creators consulted former world chess champion and grandmaster Garry Kasparov during the production of the series. Much of the book relied on the advice of noted chess instructor Bruce Pandolfini, so creator Scott Frank brought both Pandolfini and Kasparov on board as consultants for the series. At one point, Kasparov was even invited to play the character Vasily Borgov. In a November interview with Slate, Kasparov said that several of Tevis' game descriptions were a bit amateurish, so he made sure they were properly translated to the screen. He recalls, I talked to Pandolfini and we picked up the key games for analysis. I basically upgraded them to make sure that those were real games and looked exactly as described in the book. On top of facilitating those adjustments, he also provided invaluable insights into Soviet chess culture that further added to the realism of the series. Chess consultant Bruce Pandolfini came up with 350 hypothetical games for The Queen's Gambit. To make it appear as if the actors in The Queen's Gambit were actually playing chess throughout the show's various matches and training sessions, chess consultant Bruce Pandolfini was brought on to draw up hundreds of hypothetical games and scenarios. During an interview with IndieWire, Pandolfini, who had been connected to The Queen's Gambit as far back as the writing of the original book, revealed that he helped create 350 different positions by the time production wrapped. To put this into perspective, Pandolfini explained that when he worked as a consultant for the movie Searching for Bobby Fischer, he only came up with 100 games. 
Even though the show was set mainly in the 1960s, women weren't actually allowed to compete in the World Chess Championship until the 1980s. According to reporting by Jennifer Bissett for CNET, Hungarian player Judith Polgar became the youngest chess grandmaster in history at just 15 years old in 1991. She refused to play in women's tournaments and instead went against and beat the best male chess players of her time. Before she ascended to those heights, her older sister Susan Polgar fought for the right for women to qualify in the World Chess Championship in 1986. Until that point, the word men's had been in the name of the event, but she worked to replace that title with open and based the tournament's eligibility on skill rather than gender. Anya Taylor-Joy received a great deal of training when it came to preparing for the Queen's Gambit's chess sequences. She revealed during a Marie Claire interview that she learned the intricate matches and all the flashy moves just minutes before shooting each scene. With the moves fresh in her memory, Taylor-Joy would add those little touches and flashes of excitement to the moves, pulling off what she described as cool choreography with her fingers. Her trainer would later tell her he had never seen someone play chess in that manner, but told her to keep it up and make it part of her character. Anya Taylor-Joy was approached to play Beth Harmon before the script was even completed. When the producers were beginning to put together the Queen's Gambit cast, Anya Taylor-Joy was approached so early in the production that the script wasn't written yet, and all the actress had to go off of was a copy of Walter Tevis' original novel. During an interview with Netflix Q, Taylor-Joy revealed that as soon as Scott Frank gave her a copy of the book, she was sold saying she knew she wanted to play Beth Harmon immediately after reading the book, but had to push her away so that she wouldn't get wrapped up in the character before being cast in the role. After several failed attempts to adapt The Queen's Gambit into a movie, Scott Frank decided to try it out as a miniseries instead. Scott Frank, who wrote and directed all seven episodes of The Queen's Gambit, had spent about a decade of his life with the property and could never get a movie off the ground. But something changed in him when he was working on the Netflix limited series Godless in 2017, and this revelation led to him and Alan Scott to turn away from the idea of making a movie and instead turn their focus to a miniseries. In the documentary short Creating the Queen's Gambit, Scott Frank and Alan Scott both pointed out that extending the scope of the story to be told over the course of a miniseries as opposed to a movie presented them with more freedom to extend the narrative. Hair and makeup artist Daniel Parker and Anya Taylor-Joy decided to make Beth Harmon a redhead after reading the script. Nowhere in the Queen's Gambit script or novel does it describe Beth Harmon as being a redhead, but after reading into the character, both Parker and Taylor-Joy thought separately that the show's main character should have fiery red hair that would make her stand out. She needs to have red hair because I want her to be completely identifiable even if she doesn't want to be, and he had thought the exact same thing, so we just started off on a really good foot. When show creator Scott Frank was planning out The Queen's Gambit, he kept telling people that he was looking for someone like Marielle Heller to take on the role of Beth Harmon's adoptive mother Alma Wheatley and felt that someone like her was best suited for the role. In creating The Queen's Gambit documentary, Frank revealed, I had been telling Bill Horberg that it's someone like Marielle Heller, and Bill said to me, why don't you just cast her? And as you can see, she's extraordinary. Scott Frank's hunch was right and Marielle Heller went on to provide one of the most dynamic performances of the entire series. 